Welcome to the West Fort Library. Today's program will begin momentarily. Supported by Verso Studios. Created locally and shared with the world. Welcome, everybody, to our celebration of Suzanne Benton's gorgeous exhibit, All About Color. Mask maker, printmaker, painter, lecturer, and performance artist, Suzanne Benton has traveled all over the world, taking her unique artwork from across the US to India to remote villages in Africa. She's had over 150 solo shows is a former Fulbright scholar, has work in major collections around the world, and she's also well known as a veteran feminist pioneer, <laughs> being a founding member of NOW in Connecticut and a founder of the Connecticut Feminists of the Arts. I first met Suzanne on Zoom back during the pandemic when Miggs and I filmed her episode of Artists in Residences. When we met in person two years later to start planning the show, I imagined a retrospective spanning the decades of her career with an exhibit that would include masks and prints. But Suzanne had other ideas. And before I knew it, my inbox was filled with over 60 images of paintings that were just bursting with color and all done within the last two to three years. So it turns out, starting during COVID and, you know, this time in, in her life, Suzanne's artwork took a surprising turn. And in place of her past focus, which was on the narrative, she began an exploration of color, which formed this totally new body of work she calls all about color. Like Monet's water lilies or Matisse's paper cuts, Suzanne refers to these works as her late style. We are so pleased to be able to share this brilliant new work with you. Much of it for the first time, I think. I want to thank the library's amazing volunteer art committee for helping make this exhibit come to life, Travis Bell for the audio, and David Bibby for the recording of tonight's presentation, which will be available on our website after the event. And now, I'll turn this over to our ever-engaging interviewer for the evening, Migs Burroughs. Suzanne, I can hardly mask my enthusiasm <laughs> for this interview. <laughs> Thank you. That's a really special mask. That was basically the first story. It's uh, the story of Sarah and Hagar from Genesis of the Bible, not the story of Abraham and Isaac because you know that Isaac had a mother. And so when uh, Abraham decided, for whatever reasons, that he was going to sacrifice his son, he was going to sacrifice her son. And there isn't a lot of Midrash. There's some in which she asked God to take her instead. And apparently he did. I can put it on and say a little something. Okay. You see, one amazing thing is when Janet and I were in Jerusalem in 1977, Sarah's tomb is made of a grid very similar to this, which I found completely astonishing. In the stories of the Bible, 
Women were judged for their usefulness to men. Sarah was uncommonly beautiful. Abraham had a God in whom he believed, and his God told him to leave the land of his people and go forth where he would become the father of nations and Sarah, the mother. A famine came and they fled to Egypt where Abraham said to Sarah, Sarah, say you are my sister. Otherwise, men will see you and see your beauty and they will kill me in order to possess you. Say you are my sister and all will go well with me. And Sarah complied. And the men came. Pharaoh's men. And they took Sarah for the harem of the Pharaoh. And Abraham received for Sarah sheep, oxen, gold, and silver, men servants and maid servants. And Sarah was confined. I bet well, you didn't think of Abraham that way. Wow. Is that something you... It's wow. in the Bible. It's in the Bible. I didn't make it up. So, in the Bible. I mean, we'll get to your work. <laughs> I mean, we've got a lot to, to go through, but I'm curious. The masks are so intriguing. I mean, they, they conceal us, but do they reveal us too? What well, is I've used them to reveal, to tell the stories that nobody would pay any attention to, especially in the w beginning of the women's movement. You know, you stood up and people said you were pretty or fat or thin or... They didn't listen to what you said, but you put a mask on, I have to tell you, they listened. <laughs> so I got hooked, and it was my art. Yeah, they're amazing. Well, let's uh, start with, so this is not a mask, but this is a, the masks that come after this. Yeah, what, what is this about? God, I mean, I love to see it so big. Uh, and I, I, thank you, my wonderful friends from years and now. Thank you so much for coming. I put this painting in, as I told Mix, because uh, it was, I was a painter. I began as a painter, although I love sculpture. I, I didn't get to sculpture until I went to New Cane, to um, Silver Mine, learned how to weld. I uh, painted ever since I got out of college, and when we moved to Ridgefield, I became pregnant. Now, I had two children, but I had had three. My second child died of a fatal genetic disease called Tay-Sachs disease, if you know what it is. Essentially, she was a baby until she died the night before Janet was born. So I took the risk to have another child and when we moved to Ridgefield, I fluke, fluke, I became pregnant. But this is meaningful today because you see, I could only get a legal abortion because there was no way I could go through that concern another nine months. And what if the child had the same disease? I just don't know what it would have done to me. But I had to ask three psychiatrists to give me permission to have an abortion. And they would only agree if I told them I was going to kill myself. So I had to convince three psychiatrists that I was about to kill myself. And how could I get three psychiatrists in time for this to happen? Well, my then husband was a psychiatrist, and he used to work at Yale. And he set them up with me. 
But I'll tell you, that experience, I did get a legal abortion, was so searing, infuriating, humiliating, that when the women's movement came just a year later, they had me. <laughs> Hook, line, and sinker. So that's why I start with that, because it was the expression, I call it enunciation. You know, Mary had no choice. Isn't that a comment? No choice for women. So I just think it's important painting. I wanted to share it with you. Thanks. So here we're starting with a couple of mask right. images. Um, that was my fifth mask. And I called it the mask of love. <laughs> Were these done for performances or for Not your own yet. art Not, pieces? But you no. can see I was posing, but I hadn't yet performed. Um, if we, uh, with the Sarah mask, that was my first performance at Lincoln Center, if you can believe. I had a show. Uh, so you see that I could never do anything like this again. But, you know, I was still, it was the language of having children was so much in my body that I had to put it in the art. And this is one of my mask tales called The Birth Story. It's the story of the way they used to treat us when we had a baby. And how big is that, just scale-wise? Is that it's life a body size? Mask. Size, full, yeah. Wow, body. It's a body. Right now, it's in the Yale Divinity School Library. As far as they're concerned, it's Mary. <laughs> I didn't dissuade them. <laughs> <laughs> So here, I'm okay. actually performing in Westport in the temple, Bethel. Um, that's my Sarah story, and it's a story I ended up performing around the world. Uh, but I started with it, and I was having a show at Lincoln Center. The, the Museum of the Performing Arts was at that, I don't know, I don't think they're still there, at that complex. And I performed outdoors. I was the first person to perform outdoors. And of course, now a million things happen out there. Um, so it was, you know, wonderfully exciting. And somehow, you know, it, it's like the right time, the right place. All of a sudden, a million things happen, and there you are. Really being an artist. <laughs> <laughs> and is, is that you? In, that's in, me. On stage somewhere? Where? Yeah, but I wasn't performing. Oh. This was a theater set I did for Vivica Lindfors, if anybody remembers. She was a Swedish actress. And in the early 70s, she had a play called I Am a Woman. I did two theater sets for her. And this is the first one. So this, um, I sold that, I sold that, and I just gave that last year to the Mattituck Museum. Um, so I made a lot of big pieces, even though I was making the mass. But then as time went on, basically, I just was making mass. But you fabricated these yourself, right? Yes, you welded completely it. myself, yeah. yeah. With my oxyacetylene welding torch in my studio. <laughs> yeah. Where do you go to learn how to I, I went to Silvermine. Oh, oh well, Silvermine did. And my teacher was a male chauvinist pig, Roger <laughs> Prince. May that go down <laughs> in history. <laughs> <laughs> he gave me a very hard time, but I didn't, you know, I did it anyway. Oh, there you are welding, okay. Yeah, that was, I wrote a book called The Art of Welded Sculpture. It's still around somewhere. You can get it very cheaply on Amazon because the libraries are letting go of it. <laughs> 1975, but I took it around the world. That book opened doors when I went around the world. I mean, sort of, this is unrelated to what we're looking at, but what, were you, did you come from an artistic family? You, no. No? There were artists, but nobody told me about them until I was, I don't know, 70. Yeah, it's an odd family. I, you know, but when you have an odd family and you have an interest in art, you really go into art. It's kind of a rare, what was their, and were they educators, were they professional? No, or? no, both of my parents uh, left school at 15. I think part of it was because of the Spanish flu. Um, my father uh, was raised in a dairy farm in Massbeth, Queens until he was 10. So he didn't go to school until he was 10. His sister, who became a feminist, uh, a first a real suffragist, she went to the White House with uh, Alice Paul. 
to convince uh, Wilson to uh, support the uh, suffrage amendment. But other than that, they never told me anything. I mean, they left Russia, Poland, Austria. You know, they never told me anything about the past. And they were difficult people. <laughs> So you didn't, they didn't take you to museums or galleries? No, no, but I had a boy next door, Adam Berkeley, um, who uh, was a, from a, a Pol he was Polish. They had fled, and they were very cultivated people, and Adam knew every museum. We went to the opera. He, I didn't know where, I mean, you know, school brought you to the Met and to Museum of Natural History. But I spent Saturdays throughout my adolescence with Adam. And we went to the opera together. <laughs> and I had a friend who was a dancer, and so I used to go, you know, I fell in love. I mean, that was a good thing about growing up in New York. I fell in love with art. But I didn't know what I was gonna focus on. And he took me to MoMA. The first time I was at MoMA, I saw a painting of Cezanne. It's just this big. And it's called Pines and Rocks. I mean, you wouldn't find it extraordinary in his oeuvre. But it just had a quality. And I thought, that's the life I want. And Adam said, go to the Art Students League. I didn't know there was an Art Students League, but I went to the Art Students League. You know, and then I went to Queens College of Major and Arts. So, so I want to get to the color things, but we'll Yeah, take a quick this look is at my this. throne. Uh, in 1975, I was sent to Art Park in Lewiston, New York. And I was thrilled, because I could do really big pieces. So I did a throne and a big sun queen. And people could, I had people, uh, one night, you know, people got on and told stories. Could you go inside? I mean, people. No, you can't go Oh, inside. you can't go inside. And it's, it's at the Benjamin Library at Rutgers now. And that's my daughter, Janet in Japan um, at, with, a, with a mask I made for the Tokyo School of Fine Arts as a demonstration, and I gave it to them. So that's the only picture of it. So do you, I'm just, are you, you know, masks, every mask is a different face, a different personality, different, do you see yourself that way? Are you a woman of many faces? I am. Yeah? I have entered these creatures. Well, you know, if you have parents who, who left school at 15, they didn't really have a lot to offer. Mm. I mean, they gave me enough that I made my life, so that was good. But I needed more family. Mm. Oh, OK. So you created, <laughs> so I, created I, a family. You know, I would be staring at these characters and going around the world and meeting these people you know, who were interested in me, as opposed to being a female artist in New York. You know, where you go into the galleries, they don't even look at you. It's not all that different now. So this is my Chitrangada. I made that in India on the first world trip. And the story was told to me by a friend who's still a friend. Um, Chitranga was a princess who was raised as a prince who could hunt and fight, and she has a love affair. And in the love affair, he comes to know her full person. So what a story. It's from the Mahabharata. Of course, uh, Peter, somebody or other, did a thing on the Mahabharata, but of course he didn't want the woman's story. So we didn't know, but I unearthed it. And it was the one wonderful story I found about women in a year of going around the world, because most of the stories were terrible. Um. So here's Janet here with my... Uh, Somu, my shaman mask, and the young Ban is my mentor, Dr. Su, and that's me. That's the Manim, the wife, who is separated from her husband in war. This is a folk tale. <laughs> and when, and in the meantime, of course, he's looking for another woman, this young <laughs> shaman. And when she appears, he tells her it would be so convenient if she would die. And she collapses. And the audience laughs. And I said, what is this to my mentor, David? And he said, people know, you know, the wife is devoted, but not that devoted. I'm going to click through a couple okay. so we can get to some. 
Oh, this is, this well, this is my Holocaust series. I, I worked in Cologne for a few years. I did a whole series on the Holocaust before Shoah, before Schindler's List. So it was an open door for me, just like the Bible was. And this is me in Tanzania, not me, <laughs> in Tanzania. I made that in Tanzania. Okay. And, uh, and this is my Hanukkah Sabbath menorah that was a commission from a temple in Long Island. And then there was a stock crash and they didn't buy it. I still have it. Does anybody want it? <laughs> What's interesting, it's the next yeah, slide, right. I happen to know is a painting, but look at the shape of the, of the, and the tree shape in the next one. Oh yes, it's reversed. The trees. And the trees, yeah. 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 Okay. Well, you know, I, we live among trees. Yeah. Uh, so is this, a, what period of your life, is, what, what yeah, stage this, was this in? This is, I, I was painting again. I was not making mass, I was printmaking and I was painting and they would take me years and I had done a painting for Janet, and I wanted it for a show, and she wouldn't give it to me, so I did another one. <laughs> and, then, and, and that's that same era. Okay. So. So they're weird. Now these are monoprints. This I think. is a monoprint. This is, and we did a artist in residence video, which is on the library's yeah. website, and at the, it, Suzanne actually makes a monoprint while we're there. Yeah, it was fun. And I was struck by in her studio. She had. She took out a roller and there was like 77 rollers on a thing. And I go, well, you really need 77 rollers? I, yeah, somehow. <laughs> yeah, but. Anyway, so this is from the Jewish heritage and it's in the, it's the fog owns it happily. And that's my women's suffrage series that I did. It's the 75th anniversary. I had a show at the uh, Women's Park in Seneca Falls, so they have that piece. A collector gave it to them. And when you walk in, if it's still there, and you pay your whatever, the piece is right in the back there. It's big, but not that big. I like it that big. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's one of the Indian ones. I don't know, the first time Janet and I were in India, it was a real challenge. There was so much poverty. I never thought I would ever go back. But then I started using the imagery and knew I had to go back and I got a Fulbright and I went back and you'd think that was enough. No, I had kept going back. <laughs> and I've used those images, uh, they're just marvelous. And the colors, of course, have to have influenced what I'm now doing. Yeah, you mentioned in some thing I read, maybe it's in the panel in there, that, that there's colors you found in India that do not exist in Connecticut. At all. <laughs> <laughs> what is that, I mean, we all have, you know, color books and there's a spectrum so what color um, what colors are those that don't exist are they just well I mean they're not in our landscape <laughs> right okay I mean we know that the colors exist that we may even wear them but they we don't see them when we, we look out the window bright. and even the, when the sun is as bright as can be it's it's nothing like that and I think that's why I like going to Florida in the winter because people everybody speaks English and the colors, are, there's a lot of similarities, not in the, what they do to that, that state, but you know, the birds and the things that are growing and the, just the feeling in the air. It's not the same, but it's similar. And I, there's something about the air, which is different everywhere, and the light, which is different everywhere, mm. that I'm very drawn to, which is why I needed I needed to go around the world. I needed, I, I don't know, I grew up in New York City. I sat on the subway and every wave of immigrants that came in, I wondered what their country was like and I ended up going as much as possible. And what is this So this place? is a, the first portrait box that I did. I was the United Methodist, if you can believe it, a little Jewish girl from Queens, sent me around the world in 1976 for a year to do my whatever. And in, I can't even remember, 96, they sent me to Bosnia to do mask and story work with refugees, women and youth. And I went to this, and I did it. It was really very powerful. And I did it with little kids and teenagers and adults. And they sent, the last day, they brought me to a, a, a program for children, after school children, they were all refugees. And two children made eye contact with me. At that time, you know, I was there long enough that all those children looked beautiful to me. 
But later, when I looked at the photos, I could see how hurt they were. But this boy looked at me, and I drew him. And then I made the, I wanted to do something special. And he has blue eyes. And I thought, look, this is a Muslim child with blue eyes. Don't we need to know that? <laughs> Don't we need to know that everything is broader than we think it is? So now we're yes. this blast of color, which is, <laughs> I did purposely because I wanted it to be a, yeah. a blast, which is when you go in that room, it's like, I don't know, it's like you're in a meteor shower. Or <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I woke up in the middle of the night last night uh, thinking about what did I really want to say. <laughs> and it occurred to me, I, I, I got a little insight because when I started going around the world using images of cultures that Americans weren't paying any attention to, I, I wanted to bring that to life in my way through my art. And a lot of artists in those countries, fledgling artists, this was the 70s, they didn't know, they were, they were mimicking modernism. They weren't bringing their tradition. And I mean, it's all different now. People, you know, we see marvelous things that people are doing. And I encouraged them to do that, so I don't know if I was a help or not. But I was so inspired by those images that when I got into the monoprints, I just kept using them and using them and using them and using them. And then I got this Fulbright to India, and, and I got invited to a gathering of Fulbrighters in a, in a gallery in New York that, was, that featured Indian artists. And it was over. I went up to the director and I said, have you ever considered showing artists who are inspired by India? Because I once did a show of artists inspired by India with masks at the Hammond Museum that I curated. And he said, oh no, that would be colonialism. <laughs> and I thought, oh my god, oh my god, I'm going to be considered a colonialist. <laughs> I just didn't know what to do. I mean, I, I had to still use those images because I love them so much. But then I found the library in Richfield has a book club, and they started reading Proust. And I was interested in Proust. And I went to the talk, and she passed around a book called Im uh, Paintings in Proust. There are 200 paintings in, referenced by Proust in his, you know, eight volume, whatever. And I opened it, and there was a painting by Rembrandt that I had taken that composition of. I had done a little thing called From Compositions in Rembrandt. And I thought, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use those images. <laughs> and I did for a lot of paint. I went to Paris. I went to the Louvre. I went to all the museums. I mean, it was just really three years. And then I went to Berlin. I was able to do that. I can now do that. I want you to know I can now do that. But now I'm not doing it. Anyway, I went to Berlin to see two paintings that I hadn't found. And I saw a little Vermeer, that girl with the pearl necklace, that I just said, now I'm do Vermeer. So I did circling Vermeer. And then the pandemic came. I had finished circling. I didn't know what I was going to do. And then this came up. And I, I think it came from all that quiet and a kind of aloneness. I mean, I once made a joke when I went to the pool in my condominium. I said, I haven't been this alone since my kids were young. <laughs> but this was a different aloneness because I didn't have kids. And just being that quiet and alone in an in a amazing kind of way changed me. It brought something in. And that's what these paintings are. Do you think, because even though they're not narrative, I mean, you can't say, oh, there's a man and a woman, or there's right. a woman doing it. I mean, do you see them as telling stories of, of some sort? Well, I call this rescue. And I mm -hmm. think of that as a kind of goddess who's coming towards us. Oh. Mm -hmm. And it, I thought, you know, the only thing that's going to rescue us is a whole new paradigm. Uh, but unfortunately, <laughs> it hasn't fully happened yet. Uh, uh, it, it, you know, I have to say that when I started doing this work, I didn't know what I was, I thought I didn't know what I was doing. But I always knew what to do next. 
and I always knew when it was done. But when I started, I have no idea really what it's going to be. And some of them take a long time, but some of them really don't. They just, they just kind of appear. You know, I uh, very early when I moved to Ridgefield, 1965, I did, um, I did classes for uh, uh, for very young children, and and they didn't really understand that they were making the art. They would say, "Oh, look what came! Look at what this is!" They didn't understand that they had made it. And that's kind of how I feel about this work. <laughs> I'm three years old, and I'm, I have, and I know color, obviously, and I just need it. I, I, need, I need that much in front of me. Did, did you need it for you? I mean, they're very optimistic because they're sunny and they're know, bright. They're so but was it for you? Is it to feed you, or do you, did you really feel well, optimistic? Well, I actually think in some way, it is about global warming that everything is going to look different. I think that's part of it. So it, it, it's sunny, but I think there's part of there's something cataclysmic also there. Mm. Uh, but it's like another realm. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's the realm we go into because you know, I'm 87 years old. Okay, and I've recently had lung cancer. Serious, and so I have thought a lot about those things, but I have worked throughout it all. And at one point, they gave me this immunotherapy pill, which I took for seven weeks, and I got weaker and weaker and weaker. And so there are some paintings in there of the weak time when I was so weak, but I could still paint. That's I had to paint. I, I mean, I think I, Nikki and I had a talk. Art saves us. You know, we're so lucky that, that we have that voice because it speak, it gives to us. It's not just that we give to it. It gives to us. And, and so I think it's kept me alive, frankly. And then when I stopped taking the pill and regained some strength, the color came back. You, and it's here. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it, um, but now when we were, Carol and I, and, and um, we went to pick up your work, and you, I think you were telling us about your physical regimen, your, your <laughs> workout. Could you tell us? It was so fascinating because I was exhausted listening to it. <laughs> I know. You looked, I looked at you when I was what, telling you. Tell what you. Well, first of all, I have swum a mile for decades, three times a week. And I kept swimming. I mean, even when I couldn't even get, I could hardly get to the end of the thing, I got there and gasping and whatever. But I, and after the surgery, they took a lobe away from me. They took the cancer out. I was amazed. I thought I'd go to the pool and maybe I could kick. I actually, I don't know, did 20 laps or something. So I built myself up. But I now decided when we couldn't go outside because the air was so bad that I would go to the gym and do the cross trainer. So I got on the cross trainer and after a quarter of a mile, I had to sit down for 10 minutes and, <sighs> and now I do a mile. Calm, calm. And now I'm weight training. I used to weight train. I'm weight training. <laughs> and I'm walking on the treadmill only a quarter of a mile. But I can see. I am opening doors faster. I'm going down the stairs. I feel, I mean, this is like so exciting because I thought I was dying, you know? And I think this has happened. It's happened to you, not just me. You go through a time that is so dark. You don't think it's ever going to end. And then, you know, things get better. <laughs> and maybe it's the best, even. So you so, believe, I mean, these are? This was the beginning. This is when I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there is some figurative. Yeah, so I had the, I, I, I didn't know I had lung cancer when I was doing these. But I've had other cancers. And the birds have, came into the work when I, had the cancer, because it was like getting, getting free. So I didn't know that I had lung cancer, but I had this need to really work like mad 
And I, I think of it now that my body thought I was, my body knew I had this thing, but I didn't know. And it didn't know if I was going to make it. Why should it know? <laughs> so do you, you know, people have the phrase, the healing power of art. I mean, do you believe, is that just for the art? The, it's healing for an artist to make art? Or do you think, can the viewer, can the viewer be healed by art? I would hope, yes. And, you know, I mean, there is art therapy, too. Hmm. But I, I mean, look, we've all been, those of us who love art have been so moved by art. And I think it is, it is the healing thing. And it, of course, it should be given more credence for that, for that purpose. So this one, Janet and I went to an uh, artist residency, which I do not recommend in upstate New York, <laughs> because the house they gave us was full of mold. And that's when I coughed up blood. And so maybe it saved my life because the mold exacerbated, I have no idea. But I had a lovely studio in what maybe was a garage, and they had put a patio in the back and big dogs. It was nice. Light came in. And that was the last painting that just sent, seemed the most visionary of what I was doing. And you know, then I came home and find out what, what mm. ha was happening to my body. So, but anyway, it was beautiful. Okay, so this, I put this one in because that was the week time. Oh. It's a tiny little piece. It's only five by it's seven. It's very serene. I mean, it's just the horizon. It's yeah. It's very quiet. I, well, you know, I, I go in that studio and I'm calm. You know, it just is breath to me. Well, I want to leave some time for questions. <laughs> I don't know if we have... Maybe this one. Oh, this is big. Yeah, this is called the New Day, which was which I did before, you know. Mm -hmm. So I was feeling actually, and you know what? I mean, look, I was born in 1936, so you know there was the Second World War. They had had the Depression, the Second World War, and then I saw this resurgence that that came and that kept coming, and so you know this is a dark time, and we may or may not get to see the other. But it will come. It will come. Well, thank you. That was a nice, positive note to, to end on. <laughs> um, any questions for anybody? A silence? What's next? What's next? What's next? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, an interesting thing happened uh, last Saturday. The Met had a workshop on um, fauve color. And I thought, I have to go to that, which was really a big deal because I haven't been to New York. Number one, I didn't think I'd get on the train and last to get into the city and, you know, walk from the subway, but I did. And I took their little workshop, and we were to do portraits. And she had us use colored, um, watercolor crayons to do watercolors, which I had never done because you can get really bright color. I didn't know that. So that's what I'm going to do when I'm really old. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long way to go. I, I have a question. There was a phrase that you used. I don't know if it was in our interview. Or the, it was during COVID, and you said the experience was neo transcendental. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, I, transcendental, you know, it's like you're, you're, you're overcoming all the all the hard things, and that there's an, somehow another realm. I mean, I said to Janet today, we are ants in the picture of everything. You know, we think we're so great. <laughs> but, you know, the bigger picture is something we don't know what it is. And, you know, we don't even know what's out there, and we may never know. Yeah. Well, we're all made of stardust. There's that song, Dust right. in the Wind, and we're all made of... Stardust, actually. But right. Anything else? Or, uh, yeah. Uh, that's such a good question. And I, you know, I'm writing a memoir that's called The Spirit of Hope. I needed, first of all, I loved sculpture when I was in college, but 
I was pregnant and we moved seven times in seven years, so there was no way I could set up anything. And when we got to Ridgefield, I had a ground floor studio, and I knew I was wanting to do sculpture. But the thing about welding and hammers was part of dealing with Oh, you know, the tragedy of my daughter, the fury over discovering the patri what the patriarchy does to us. So banging away <laughs> was something I needed to do for a really, really, really long time. And it felt good. And the other thing was, you know, when you weld, I had this plastic mask. I, I wore a mask, you know, to protect me theoretically, whether it did or not, from the fumes. But it was a mask that goes down. I'd put this mask down, and I wore a leather apron and these leather gloves, <laughs> big, fat leather gloves. And I had on these shoes that I would get in the men's store. The men were all freaked out to give me these men's <laughs> shoes. And I would go to the scrapyard, you know. But it's like it was another person. This wasn't the, the woman primed to be a female. This was some kind of creature that I was. And I, as soon as I put the mask down, I was that creature. And when I was that creature, there was a whole, you know, I had married a psychiatrist, for crying out loud. So, you know, the stream of consciousness, you know, was very important. So I just let my mind roam to whatever. And I'll tell you, of all those masks, you can see the ones that are very refined and beautiful. And then there are these, ah! <laughs> that was another day. OK, and that's a scary note. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes? What's well, the wonderful thing is that there really are a lot of good stories about women now. But I don't think that I'm the one to tell them, because there's a whole new generation of people who are phrasing it in the way for now. So I mean, I think the stories I'm telling is that I'm, re, I'm rekindling my life. So I'm, I'm writing uh, the different aspects of my life, which is a, I, re, it, I recommend that for everybody, especially when you get older. Because when you're younger and things happen to you, you, have a, you blame a lot of people and you criticize a lot of people. And when you get older, you understand, first of all, you had a role. <laughs> and then you have more understanding about the, the complexity of these people, of my, my mother and the way my father treated my, didn't treat my mother. You know, I mean, how did that affect her? anger, you know, and that was just the way it was. But I don't have the same hurt feeling uh, that I had uh, when all those things happened. One more. Yes, definitely. And then I realized that telling stories with the mask was very empowering. And then I realized if I just guided people into simple mask making and letting them tell a story that it was empowering. So that that was, you know, I mean, it just felt like I had a mission. And then when the United Methodists sent me around the world, you know, I mean, it was just fascinating because look, we have a common humanity. And people tell stories that we can all understand and feel connections to. And, you know, it was transformative for me and, and of some of the, you know. I mean, I meet people even today who saw a performance or did a workshop and they, they never forgot it. So how grateful I am that I was able to, it was right time, right place. Last question, anybody? Okay, thank you so much, Suzanne. That was wonderful.
I'm absolutely thrilled. You know, this is the first show I've had since the pandemic, and so much has happened. It feels like such an overcoming. So I'm so mm -hmm. delighted that you're all here. Thank you very much. We're delighted you're still here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us about the cape? Oh, the cape. Yeah. Want to model it? <laughs> I'll, uh, when I leave. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so this, you know, I went through the 60s. I was a married woman with two kids, so I couldn't be a real hippie, but I could certainly, you know, be bold, which ended up. So Sass Colby lived in Ridgefield at that time. She's since long time moved to California, which probably was, the color was better. And <laughs> we made a trade. And I got this cape and she got a mask. And I haven't worn it for probably 40 years. So today was the day. Oh, very nice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're still in touch, so I'm going to let her know I wore it to the opening. You fly, yeah. Yes. No, she flies without it, but. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>